Our next presenter comes from Bournemouth on the south coast of the UK. Uh, she is a children, youth, and family minister at a Baptist church. But on the side, and isn't that typical of those of us in youth ministry, on the side, uh, she runs a nonprofit ministry called Street Space Bournemouth. Bournemouth is, uh, am I pronouncing that correctly? Nope. Nope, not at all. <laughs> She's going to correct but me. But it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> How do I say it? Bournemouth. Born, okay, yep. Bournemouth. Bournemouth. Yep, Street Space. Mm-hmm. It is uh, the fifth largest LGBT community in the UK, and uh, Gemma just, she does ministry there. She knows the community well, and I'm eager to hear her talk about that, but I'm also eager to hear her talk about what it means to be a cupcake anarchist, mm-hmm. So, which is another part of her bio. So let's welcome Gemma. And you think my accent is weird. (laughs) As an evangelical youth worker, I am passionate about seeing young people encounter the fullness that Jesus has to offer them. My heart's desire is to see young people not just connect with God when they're teenagers, but to see that thriving continue throughout their life. It's my job to equip them, to enable them to actually live this out. But friends, the sad reality is that for many of our teenagers, surviving is a nightmare. And thriving is a dream that many dare not dream. The reality for being a teenager is that depression, self-harm, bullying and suicide rates are high regardless of your gender identity, your sexuality or any of those other factors that we like to give a letter to. In the UK, the statistics say that 6% of 16 to 26 year olds have attempted suicide. So mainstream teenagers, 6%. Those stats jump to 48% of the same age bracket if the person identifies as transgender. They're 25% if the person identifies as LGB. And I'm not talking about having suicidal thoughts. This is attempted suicide. So as we said, I'm not from round here. I live in a little place called Bournemouth, which if you look at the UK and you see London, that's what most of you think is the whole of the UK. (laughs) (coughs) There are other parts. You follow London down and just to the left, and right before you fall off is where I live. This is my beach. But I don't live there alone. Bournemouth has the fifth largest LGBT community in the UK. For 40 years, LGBT people have gathered in our community. The space that the community exists in is called the Triangle. It's a geographical space called the Triangle because it's a triangle. (laughs) Like, we don't have the block systems that you have here. Our roads wiggle and turn, and in this community, it is a geographical triangle with an open space in the middle that is kind of created for community. It has a multi-million pound public library, a school, cafes and independent restaurants. It's got nightclubs and barbers. It's got a fancy dress shop. It's got a beautiful nail salon. (laughs) It's even got a Starbucks. It's pretty much like every other community in the UK and probably not too different from your communities over here. But for decades, the evangelical church has had very little to do with it. 
In fact, 11 years ago, a group of evangelical Christians came to town for the weekend on a crusade. They wanted to publicly preach and teach in our community, turn or burn messages. And so our Metropolitan Community Church leader gathered our LGBT community, took them to another space and had a party. I just want you to hold that thought. We removed our community from their community and took them to a third space to stop them, to save them, to protect them from Christians. 2004, friends, we're not talking decades ago, we're talking just one. A game-changing weekend. We don't know whether many people turned, repented, and were baptized. In fact, probably not, because I'm sure if they did, we would know about it. But what we do know is that this was a game-changer. It meant that the doors to our evangelical churches for this community were shut, were bolted, and were locked. A favorite quote that people often use when talking about our community is, well, you know, we've got to love the sinner and hate the sin. The irony is that that's not even the real quote. That's a Gandhi adaption of a quote by St. Augustine, which actually works out as, with love for mankind and hatred for sins. And so what happens in our community when people hear this is that they don't hear love, they hear hate, sin, sinner. Three things that strike at them. One of my um, friends was really honest with me. She said, "Uh, Gemma, I need to call you out on some things. She said, you're a pastor of an evangelical church. I love you. But friend, you sin, and I hate your sin. I thought, okay, cool, what have I done? What's today's thing? She said, well, I love you, but have you ever thought about your obesity? Have you ever thought about the gluttony that you must engage in because you're pretty big? And then she said, Have you thought about stepping down from your ministry? Have you thought about not working with children because you put them at risk by your lifestyle choices? Of course she didn't say that. She was making a mockery of what we tell others. But she raised a point. See, whatever way we dress it up, when we use those phrases, we don't really love. And it is bonkers, I mean ridiculous, to assume that someone's gender identity or their sexuality puts our children at risk. But it's a story I hear time and time again. We haven't been known for the ways in which we love our community very well, friends. There were many little moments that led me to this place where we are now. And some of them... Uh, I will share when we do the Digging Deeper session if you're interested, but they're not for the platform. But they have created what we refer to in our house as the sledgehammer moment. The fact that Jesus says, whatever you do for the least of these, you've done for me. The fact that he says, when you love one another as I have loved you, that's good. The fact that he says, you're called to love your neighbors as you love ourselves, well, these are my neighbors. And so Maya Angelou says, Love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, it leaps fences and penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. Or in my case, I'd been praying for years for someone else to come and reach my community. And one day God said, have you ever thought that you're the answer to the prayers? So he said, pick up your sledgehammer Smash the walls down and get busy loving the saints. And I had to explain to my family what was going to happen. I said this to my husband, 
I said, I think we have to do this, and in reality it means I'm probably never going to get a job in youth ministry paid by a church again. We're going to do this, and all of our friends are going to reject us. We're going to do this, and it's going to be painful, and we're going to be skint. That means we've got no money, just to translate. (laughs) You need to put subtitles. (laughs) But we couldn't any longer stay silent. I mean, imagine what the Gospels would look like if Jesus just went, it's not going to pay me anymore. People are going to give me a hard time. Our history would be very different. Sometimes our silence speaks more than our words, and for us, we just couldn't do it anymore. There are a few things that this has meant for us. It's meant that we've got involved in our community. These are pictures of my community. It means that we've been unashamedly present in the community. I have lost count of the number of times that Christians have said to me, secretly, behind my work, I affirm LGBT people, but I'm not going to be public about it. Or the number of ministers who I've known all my life have said, I would love to come with you when you do that thing, but I can't be seen in that place because it will affect my job. Come on, friends. So we don't hide away. We get involved. We're very present. We believe it means choosing solidarity over charity. See, charity is a short-term action. It means that I do something to you for which I feel better and actually doesn't really change you. Solidarity, on the other hand, is more horizontal. It respects you and gives value to you and all that you will bring to me. A friend of mine writes about symbiotic youth ministry, how each individual, the two individuals, youth worker and the young person, brings something together. And that when they each partner in something, a little bit of the youth worker goes to the young person, a little bit of the young person goes to the youth worker, and a third thing is created. It's in solidarity that we do a lot of our work. It means that when, um, two weeks' time, when there's anti-transgender day of remembrance happens, when the transgender day of remembrance happens, sorry, got my words muddled up, We stand with our community and remember all those who've been murdered at the hands of anti-transgender violence. So in our triangle, last year we remembered 81 people on an official list. The church needs to remember. If we don't remember, then we are doomed because it means that we don't change the, the present and then the future doesn't change either. The youngest person on that list was an eight-year-old boy from Brazil, beaten to death by his parents. Solidarity means that none of us are paid to do our jobs. It means that the income that my not-for-profit has is about $35 a month. See, we're not paid, it's a decision we've made, So that when we make friends with people, they can't say, you're here because you're paid to be our friend. Solidarity mixes it all up. And it means that when I wanted to go forward for my ordination training, and my church said they wouldn't fund me, it's my gay pride who have paid my fees. We talked a little bit about cupcake anarchy. Anarchy um, is a bad word, usually. But the root of it isn't. It's just to disrupt, to overthrow, to overturn. And people are forever asking me, how did you make friends in your community? Well, we made friends with cupcakes. I mean, not, you know, rubbish ones. I mean, really good (laughs) cupcakes. See, it's really hard for someone to ignore you when you're giving them really good cake. (laughs) I'm, I'm honest. This is honest. It costs hardly anything. But I rocked up in the community and gave everybody cupcakes. I went to sex shops and said, God's told me to give you you a cupcake. And they thought I was a little bit bonkers, but when they ate the cupcake, within half an hour, without fail, I would get a text message saying, thanks for the cupcake, when can you come back? 
It disrupts and it challenges. We write love letters on Valentine's Day because we believe in celebration. We post these love letters in our community, string them up, because we believe that God has something to say to people, that he has to remind them that they have a worth and a value and that they are loved. We make pom-poms because we love to cheerlead for our community and to tell people how brilliant they are, but we can't always be with them. So tiny woolen pom-poms, it sounds bonkers, it's a little quirky, we give to them as a reminder that when we're not with them, they can be their own cheerleaders. But friends, our LGBT family are not Pokemon. We believe that we, it, this for us means refusing to sell their stories. As youth ministers, it is not for us to collect their stories and to stand on a platform and tell you them. They are not our stories. Some of us are afforded places of privilege, but usually when we tell you the story, they aim to break your heart. They're not our hurts to share. And they aim to convince you that we are successful. Sometimes we get things right. Sometimes we say the right thing at the right time and God is glorified. Praise the Lord. But mo most of what happens is we get it wrong. We upset people, we say the wrong things, and we distract people from God. But we don't want to pimp out the stories of others. And so you won't hear that from me. We believe in muddy puddles. Yesterday we were talking about what it means to be a peacemaker and the difference between peacemaking and peacekeeping is a muddy puddle. It means getting dirty. Yeah, we know the club of verses. I've got a BA in applied theology, I've got an MA in theology, which has all been around those verses to work out what our Christian youth work response is to LGBT teens. But, we know the other verses too. We know that we're called to love our community. We know that we're not called to point out specks when we've got whopping planks in our eyes. We know that we're called to love. See, in the muddy mess, there's a disconnect, but we stand in it. We're not afraid of it. It means that some of our friends can't stand with us. It means for me that I've been uninvited from my friends' christenings of their children because I've gone too far. Too far in rescuing a kid who's stuck on a bus when he knows that the bus behind him has someone who wants to get him and I go to rescue them. To stand in the way, too far. Too far when I go into a gay bar and host a cocktails and carols event so that 150 people get to hear about the truth of Jesus incarnate, get to sing, get to celebrate. Too far. Too far when we tell our gay pride people that we are sorry for how the church has treated them and that Jesus loves them and we throw them a picnic. Well, if that's too far, then I'll stay in the muddy puddle. And you don't need to join me, but maybe you want to. So friends, do you believe in celebration? Do you believe in solidarity? Do you believe in not selling the stories of others to get a place of platform, but in sitting, if need be, in a dirty, smelly, muddy puddle? I hope you do.